Hello everybody, I'm Sarah and I'm a recorder player. Welcome to my introduction to the Great Bass, one of the most fascinating sizes of recorder. I've travelled around to try different instruments out for you and though this video is an introduction to a larger topic, I'm going to point you in the direction of some brilliant sources as well. So let's hear what they sound like first off. <laughs> is a great bass recorder. When we think of bass recorders we're often referring to this one, the bass in F. Um, this is actually the smallest member of the bass recorder family so we mostly nowadays refer to this as a bassette, a little bass. The great bass is the next size down. The great bass is one octave lower than a tenor recorder and two octaves lower than a soprano recorder. Today they're standardised and tuned in C. If you play a scale from the bottom up with these fingerings, you get C major. We're going to find out that throughout history they've been in different pitches, varying pitches and with varying names, but that's basically where we're at. Today they're used a great deal in recorder orchestras, we hear them in ensembles, there's a few solo pieces and I have been playing mine in my band. I mean, you can use them for absolutely anything you like. Is there a historical precedence for these instruments? Of course there is. In his fantastic online Renaissance recorder database, Adrian Brown has listed no less than 24 surviving Renaissance great basses. From the maker's marks appearing on the instruments, we know that these come from famous instrument families such as the Bassano family, Gress, also Schattenbach and Schnitzer. And these instruments have been found across Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, Romania, Austria. Interestingly, none in France, but I'm gonna get to that later. The surviving recorders seem to be mostly made in maple wood, though we have a few in plum wood and even cherry. The great thing about this database is that you can actually see the specific measurements of the recorders and their pitches. Now, I've already said today, modern great basses are standardised in C, but these instruments surviving vary from D sharp to B. Let's not forget we're assuming that this is tuned in high Renaissance pitch and A was 466 hertz. So all of these surviving instruments in C sharp are for all intents and purposes in C. Now, though the pitches aren't standardised and do vary, Adrian Brown does say that consorts of recorders are commonly tuned in fifths. So you would have a big bass recorder, what we'd now call a contrabass in F, a great bass in C, and then a bassette in G. These groupings of instruments in F, C and G were very common and the nice thing is that they line up really well with the vocal ranges of bosses, tenor or altus and cantus. Yes, recorder players would very often be playing vocal music. So looking at the size of a recorder as its role within a consort rather than starting on a fixed C, it does make sense that these could vary a little bit. The human voice varies as well, as did tuning from city to city. So that could be why we see these recorders in B, in D. As long as the instrument can play the notes you need, we're good. If you want to get more into tunings of Renaissance instruments and how they fit together in a consort, do go to Adrian's website. He has done so much research and he's truly an expert on this. And then we do get mention of Renaissance great basses in many places. In Praetorius's treatise Syntagma Musicum from 1614, we see great basses in B flat depicted alongside contrabasses in F. And Marin Messen also talks about them in his 1636 treatise Harmonie Universelle. Side point, I did a project on this treatise when I was a student and I couldn't find a translation in English. I just remember trying to read this Renaissance French. It did not go well. I'm reading this here. He talks about three grandes flutes sent from England to one of our kings. Um, and these seem to be the bass, the great bass, and the extended contrabass. So here we're talking about our bassette in G, 
our great basin C, our contrabasin F. Sent from England, they're presumably made by this famous Bassano family who were based in London. And Marin Masson urged the French makers to copy these instruments because he hadn't seen them yet in France. Remember in the Renaissance recorder database? I didn't find any examples of French ones. So here in 1636, we finally have evidence of these sizes of recorder coming to France. And did they stick around in France? Why, yes they did, with the French composer Lully. But first, let's meet a Renaissance recorder. <sighs> I have a Renaissance C bass. Those of you with keen ears will notice that this is actually in Renaissance pitch, 466 hertz, that's our A. So it means the A actually comes out a semitone higher. This beautiful Renaissance bass was built by Adriana Brokink, um, recorder builder, and this is part of the consort owned by Block 4, which is the quartet that I'm playing with at the moment. How is this different to a regular C bass? Often with Renaissance recorders, you've got a few different fingerings, the most common one being an open D. So whereas normally you put finger two down, here it's with nothing. Or if I'm gonna be, I might tune it with finger three. Let's have a look. These tend to be really sonorous due to the shape of the bore, it's a bit wider, giving it's a different sound to your Baroque C bass. Makes the range a little bit smaller, but I think that's a good trade off for the sound. Uh, uh, yeah, Renaissance C bass. We're gonna edge more to the Baroque now, and for this segment, I would like to thank the amazing David Lasocki for his research and his book, Not Just the Alto. This is such a thorough and fascinating book. I really urge you to buy it. You can get it on PDF download as well. You won't regret it. Where are we now? 1681, the French court with Lully. He wrote an opera in 1681 called Le Triomphe d'Amour. And judging by the ranges of the parts, we have music here for a great bass recorder. He calls for a grande basse de flûte as well as a petit bass de flute. So that could be your bassette recorder and your great bass. And the context of the great bass here is still as part of a consort, part of an ensemble. It's not being used as a solo instrument. After this, we can pick up hints about music that could be for a great bass recorder because the music goes down lower than an F. An example of this is Charpentier's Midi in 1693 or one voice in a recorded trio by a composer I'm ashamed to say I didn't know, Wilderer, uh, in an opera called La Monarchia Stabilita in 1703. And then we see what we think can be great bass recorders popping up in auction listings, places where instruments or household items are being sold. In 1759, we have the Dutch bookseller Nicholas Selhoff, from Den Haag. He lists un flute douce long du bass, or a long bass recorder, and this long qualifier is the important part. And to nicely tie all of this together, there are two surviving Baroque great basses. One is by Denner, as we know, one of my favourite historical makers, and another by a maker I haven't heard of called N. Bopper. So thank you so much David Lasocki for doing this research. Everything I've just said is down to David, and I'm barely scratching the surface of what he talks about in his amazing book. So please go buy it. And after this, the great bass recorder seems to fall out of use. Why? Maybe it was expensive to make. It was unwieldy to carry around. Even in Praetorius's treaties at the start of the 17th century, he remarks that the bass and great bass recorders can't be heard very well in a church. And by the Baroque, the alto had emerged as the star of the show. That's what everyone wanted to play. So, yeah, sorry, great bass. Would you like to hear some Baroque great bass? Yes, okay. <laughs> A 
Hello, here today with me I have a Baroque grape base by Kung. This is the Kung Superior model. So your Baroque grape base will be designed so that you can play it with your normal Baroque fingerings. This means you can go from your soprano or your alto straight to this and play it with the same fingerings and it just works. <laughs> Apart from the very bottom, that is going to be different. So here at the bottom, we have quite a lot of extra key work. This key is for the C, the C sharp. I have to stretch quite a bit there. And up here, it makes the E flat. This is because we obviously don't have the double holes down there. I have to say, it's very ergonomic. I really like having that E flat key. That works for me. This great bass has a knick. Nick, never sure how to pronounce that, head joint, which means, as you can see, it's bent. There are other great basses by other makers who have a straight recorder and then a crook coming from the top. How does a great bass feel to play in terms of air? I do notice, I mean, it takes more air than I'm used to with a soprano or an alto. With regular playing, little and often, I think you'll get used to it quite quickly. In my experience, the straight great bass recorders with a crook are a bit easier in terms of how much air you blow because then you can use your lips to make a tighter embouchure that gives you a bit more resistance that's easier for the blowing. A direct blow mouthpiece like this feels more recognisable but the hole that my air is being lost into that's quite a big hole so that takes um, takes some getting used to. What about the stretch for your hands? I have to say with the key work this feels like a smaller stretch than the tenor. I have small hands and this is just very, very easy. The thing that you might have to get used to is the little finger to stretch down to that bottom C sharp. That is quite a stretch for me. How to hold this? As you can see, I'm using the neck strap, which is attached to the ring on the back of the recorder. But this particular recorder also comes with a stick stand. I'm gonna show that to you now. Here we have literally a stick that you can put in the bottom of the recorder. It's nicely corked. And I think here you can, yeah, you can adjust the length of it to fit the person. Amazing. So that was a Baroque great bass. Well, well, a modern pitched standardized version of a great bass built to Baroque specifications. So you know what I mean? At this point, let's talk about the name of this instrument because it has proved confusing. Historical sources vary. So in the 17th century, we have Taubot referring to a bass in F and a great bass under it in C. But then we also have Praetorius referring to a basset in F, a bass in C, and then the great bass in F, what we would call a contrabass. In David's book, he's actually made a super handy table comparing the names of different sizes of recorder today and in history. It's, and actually pretty much all of them vary. And I do wanna mention, in this video, I'm calling it a great bass recorder. That's what it's referred to in the UK. When I'm working in the Netherlands, we refer to it as a C bass recorder, a bass recorder in C. I've not called it a C bass in this video because we've seen examples of this general size of recorder starting on a B or starting on a D sharp. How to read music for the great bass recorder. Typically, the great bass recorder is notated in bass clef an octave lower than it sounds. So the bottom note of C with all of the holes closed would be notated as the C under the bass stave with a ledger line, and it would sound as the C in the middle of the bass stave. I always find it a tricky one. This is the only recorder that's notated in this way. I have to admit, I'm a little bit lazy with reading it like that. Feel free to read it in the treble clef. Anything notated for soprano or tenor recorder, you can play it as it is, and it will sound great. You'll just sound an octave or two lower. Oh, and before I tell you about music for the instrument, let's introduce you to my pet sword. I talked about pet 
sold instruments a lot on my channel. Um, these were first developed as a way to make the larger sizes of recorder more accessible to people playing in recorder orchestras. And I have to say the Great Bass is my favourite size of pet sold. It's got that low sound but it's still really agile. Its key work is very loud and that's because I've had this instrument a long time. The pads need to be changed. Actually the new pet sold recorders by Kunat have much softer pads so I think I'm going to get that installed. What about music? What can you play on these? So we've seen that historically great basses were used as part of a recorder consort and that's something you can still definitely do, especially if you're lucky enough to be able to get your hands on a contrabass recorder. Um, today they are a staple of the recorder orchestra repertoire. I know in England this is really active. To be honest, I don't know of a great deal of solo music specifically for the great bass. You do have the great bass uh, practice book, either notated in bass or treble clef by Hugh Gorton. We've got a really nice book of five jazzy duets for two great basses called Sea Bass for Two, haha, <laughs> nice pun, by Marge Hall. And a book of duets for great bass and bass recorder by Steve Marshall called Sicilian Defense. But if you've got a great bass, you can basically, basically, you can play anything you like on it. If you're playing alone at home, it does not matter if you come out in a different key. Try your Baroque sonatas, try some folk tunes, anything to get used to the way it feels and it plays. And finally, instruments. I can imagine some of you are now raring to go, itching to get your hands on one of these great basses. What can you buy? There are actually loads on the market. For Renaissance style ones, we have the Koblicek Praetorius models, the Merck Renaissance models, and the Mollenhauer Kinsaker models. These will be Renaissance instruments, but often with more of a Baroque style fingering, so the jump isn't as big. Then for your Baroque style great basses, you have instruments by Mollenhauer, by Merck, by Kung, and by Yamaha. And for your modern instruments, I've shown the pet sold already, but you also have the Millennium Basses uh, created by the Korsma factory in the Netherlands. These are nice because they're very, very lightweight, both of the fingers, and they have these nice crooks that you can direct the airstream with as well. And of course, if you're in the market for a professional handmade instrument, there are so many makers who are excellent at this. I can't hope to get everybody, but here's some that I could think of. If I've missed someone, please put them in the comments below. So I think we have come to the end of our little journey into the world of the Great Bass Recorder. This is only an introduction. If you're interested, please go and check out the sources. I mentioned Adrian's website, David's book. If you have other sources that you'd like to share, please do so in the comments below. And do you play Great Bass Recorder? Let me know. As always, you can subscribe to my channel by clicking on my face down here. Over here's the Team Recorder Patreon where you can support the channel and here are two more videos. Thanks for watching and have a great day.